Welcome to Team Futurism. Today we are talking with Chris Marshall, who is the author of the new book, Decoding Change, Understanding What the Heck is Going On and Why We Should Be Optimistic About the Future. Chris is based in Wales and has a really interesting background in psychology and a couple of other fields. And it seems like he has a lot of interest that overlap with mine and what we do here at Team Futurism, which is looking towards the future without being too doomer about it, really like finding the, the bright side of all the, the potential that we can tap into in terms of technology, but also in terms of our human potential. Chris, give me a little bit of your background. I know that you've done a lot and you have a, you know, a lot of varied interests, but what's kind of like a potted background for you? Yeah, that, firstly, thank you so much for, for having me on, on your podcast. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Um, so kind of to give people a potted history of, of me, I kind of stumbled into the investment markets in 2007. Um, little did I know that this was kind of the peak euphoria before the world was going to crash. Um, but that's where I found myself. And I'd, I'd come off basically a background within a uh, kind of combination of, of sports background and personal training. I, I skied as a youth on the British ski team. And that's really where my love for psychology came came in, performance psychology in particular. In 2007, I found myself in this kind of investment job. Uh, I was working with one of the global banks. And what became apparent was the models they were using, certainly when the crash unfolded, the economic models just didn't bear any resemblance to, to reality. Uh, mm. I think kind of we could go as far as like August 2008 in the in the European Commission at the time was saying, oh, everything should be fine. We can see what's going on in America, but we're really strong and got this strong domestic economy. And it's just going to shave a few basis points of our of our growth. Um, and it was it was that moment. You know, I think that we all have these pivotal moments in life. And that for me was one of them. And it was a, this kind of this moment to stand back and go, OK, well, if that doesn't work, if those models don't work and tell us what's going on, what does. Uh, that's when I started to get interested in both behavioral economics and futurist uh, or foresight work. Um, and really, I, I've, I've had those two strands like in my in my belt um, ever since. So I, I find it hard to tell people what I do. That's probably where I've earned the nickname, the uncertainty scientist, because I look at both how the world is changing I concentrate on trends and mega trends because they're they're fairly stable. Um, and then I also, on the other side of the fence, still have this love for performance psychology. And I would describe myself as kind of a high performance coach working with individuals to essentially equip them with the tools to thrive in conditions of, of heightened disruption. Um, so that's kind of my my bag. Um, and the book came out, as you as you said, so this was published 2022. And the, the kind of the reason and background to that was I, I suddenly kind of my journey had given me these tools to understand a slightly better how the world was changing. I'm not going to say I've got a crystal ball, <laughs> but uh, it, it gave me a framework. And so this was the opportunity to deliver that framework for others. Uh, as I said, it, most of my work in certainly in the future space looks at trends and megatrends um, with a with a massive kind of bias towards uh, behavioral economics and biases in our thinking and, and things that block us from seeing change going on. So I want to definitely talk about psychology quite a bit. My background is in psychology, ended up going to law school, but initially I was, I was, uh, my BA is in psychology and that was my pursuit for quite some time. Um, but before we get there, maybe I do want to ask a few questions about, I mean, I don't know, global finance in general, cause this is something that's totally out of my wheelhouse. And I just, I'm curious to pick your brain on it a little bit. So I just want to start with crypto. I, I've been trying to write about crypto. I've wanted to do a podcast about it. I feel like I I am completely in, I just fall into two worlds of, I have friend groups and I know a lot of very smart people who say that crypto is still the future. It's going to be huge. Um, you know, RFK Jr. just tweeted yesterday that uh, he's going to make block or um, uh, Bitcoin something, 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 because it's so crucial for human flourishing and the freedom of humanity. And then you also hear people, you know, I follow Scott Galloway and other people like that who say that crypto is like just a Ponzi scheme and it's done, like it's over, it's done. I, 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 I There are people in both camps that I respect. I don't know where I land and I almost feel like I don't even, I, I mean, I certainly don't feel comfortable right now writing about it. 
but I'd love to because it's fascinating. And I own some, you know, I own a little crypto. It's fun. And I would never like put my life savings in it. But what what is do you have any insights in terms of like maybe, you know, global trends? Is crypto part of the future or is it is it perhaps like just a big illusion? I think what you've just described there is is absolutely perfectly the disruption and uncertainty that occurs when you get a a potential paradigm shifting innovation. Um, so so I mean my view I'm I'm very much with you like the verdict is out. Um, you get proponents of crypto and blockchain, and it's certainly from from the the way they talk about it. If those things are realised, then yes, crypto and blockchain have the potential to radically change. A whole host of things, but then there's another host of things, different innovations. Let's you know throw in quantum computing that would just blow crypto out the water. Um, and this is always the case. And I think I think what you've just latched onto uh, something which I talk a lot about is is the impermanence of the world around us. We like to think, you know, bring this back to psychology. We like to think that there's a status quo, that there's a there's normality, that there's stability, that the piece of ground we stand on is fixed and and certain. Our brains love that. Unfortunately, it's it's a it's an illusion. Um, nothing stays still. Everything is always changing. And when we actually stand back from these these big innovations, that's that's actually what we see. We see repetitive, and, and we see these cyclical patterns come through. That normally, for a paradigm shifting technology to essentially be that paradigm moment, what we actually find from history is that they have to cluster with other innovations so if we go all the way back to let's say james watts's steam engine so we're talking it's right at the start of the industrial revolution watts's steam engine was pretty useless by itself i know lots of people are going to be in arms about that um, but he it needed other technologies to make it useful within a factory setting a steam engine by itself did nothing it was just power but power without application doesn't go anywhere and so what you find is that cluster was actually the steam engine plus something called the water frame and the spinning jenny, two other incredible innovations which have been around for a few years and they just found a new application. So that's essentially what crypto and blockchain is waiting for. It's waiting for other things to latch onto it and really adopt it and to take it to the, to over that kind of that threshold. And if that happens, absolutely, it could be one of the things that we kind of go, OK, that was a turning moment. So right now, crypto is most effective, I would say, for criminals. Everything is is just like totally aligned for their cause, which is, you know, passing money so the government doesn't see what's going on and that sort of a thing. And that gives the government an incentive to really clamp down on it, perhaps. And I totally hear what you're saying, that... You know, we're just waiting for another innovation to, to so that it becomes more practical, perhaps, in the real world for, for normal people and their finances. But I do also fear that all it would take is just the U.S. government to say, sorry, guys, we're just done with this. There's too much criminal activity and it's done. Like, it's it's over. And, like, if you trade any crypto, it's 90 percent taxed and we're going to find you. You know, something like that. Is is that a real worry or is or is, is that also overblown? Regulation is is always out there to to kind of cause a concern. Um, it's there to de- designed to protect us, but at the same time, those powers which are used for a benefit today can restrict something tomorrow. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And if it, you know, this is this is kind of the thing which I think a lot of people with crypto are overlooking. If they're thinking this is this is the thing outside the system, then it's only allowed to be outside the system as long as the system says we allow it to be there. And as you say, you know, if if that's the only reason you believe in it, then it's a flim it's a flimsy argument in my view, because as soon as regulators kind of go, okay, well, this has now grown to a scale where we're now concerned about it, they bring it into their wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And and so, I mean, there's there's loads of other benefits to it, not just kind of the passing of value. I mean, it's it's this it's the storing of contracts. It's it's you know mm-hmm. so many different things to it, and that to me is more the is more the kind of the thing which w- would excite me is the underlying technology behind it, the blockchain, rather right. than the kind of oh yeah you know these forty million crypto tokens or whatever, you know however mm-hmm. many are out there now um, is the new currency. Um, you know it's it, unfortunately currency doesn't work like that. There's a there's a theory of currency which says that currency only has a value because the government 
tell us that they can't that we can pay our taxes in it um and you know if it if it wasn't for that we we'd still be using countless different mechanisms right well i mean one thing that that's that's stuck with me when i was recently talking with andrew yang is he has this perspective about uh money that is just like the most obvious thing but i'd never really thought about it before which is that we already live in a world where we have all different kinds of currencies like tons and tons and tons of them in terms of like gift cards and that that sort of a thing or or voucher programs or i, I mean there's there's he, he has like a list of these and it's really interesting because we it's it's all tied to the dollar, like ultimately in, in, in America. But there are all these different ways that we exchange monetary value at some level. I think that that's really interesting in terms of how in the somewhat near future, if we institute something like a UBI of some sense, it wouldn't have to be cashed. It could be something else. It could be, you know, just uh, at, you know, Every grocery store, you have a monthly voucher, that sort of a thing. I don't know. Uh, it's just kind of interesting to think about what cash really is in a practical sense, even if it is tied to the dollar or tied to something else. That to me is just really interesting. Um, my my kind of like next question here is just specifically about the idea of global trends. And I mean, how can you or how how far in ahead can you look? In, in a world where we are constantly innovating, we're always like on the brink of a new paradigm shift. Right now, I mean, the, the, a lot of headlines, especially if you follow someone like uh, Peter Zion, is global globalism is ending as we've known it for you know quite a few reasons. How how far out do you do you feel comfortable looking? And do you factor in things like you know globalism might be coming to an end? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Um, so, so in terms of kind of tr how trends, you know, kind of help us, you know, being being a futurist or, or doing foresight work isn't about predicting a specific outcome. I mean, that's probably the the first thing to point out. Um, that's just called guessing, um, <laughs> of which uh, some people get lucky and they build their entire career on 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 this and build loads of confidence around it. But professional futurist work is about building out scenarios. Um, okay. And really understanding, you know, we have these trends in play and where could those, what scenarios could that bring about? So let's take a, one of them, um, which is kind of a key trend to understand right now. And that's demographics. Um, mm -hmm. Demographics moves really slowly. And this is the beauty of a lot of trends and mega trends is they are super slow moving. Um, and, you know, you, you can kind of fairly accurately predict where a country's kind of population is going in terms of is it becoming top heavy are they replacing kind of younger workers you know because it takes us 18 years as a human to become really productive within the economy so you have these wonderful time lags um but for me it's it's actually i'm going to come back against something you said that i i don't believe we have paradigm shifts all the time we overuse that word in the modern world that we go oh my word this is a paradigm that's a paradigm um, totally fair point. <laughs> um, but th they don't occur all that often. You know, for me, the last real, if we're talking about technological paradigm shifts, the last one was in the 70s, and that was the semiconductor. You know, I completely discount the, the iPhone and things as paradigm shifts. No, they changed how we communicated, but they weren't in themselves a fundamental change in how we behaved and worked. Um, mm, you know, when we can go back. So what you find with te technological shifts is the cycle is about every 50 to 60 years. Um, and that's why everything's starting to get messy now is because guess where we are? We're, we're 50 years on from the semiconductor, you know, almost perfectly. And we've got so many different potentials. So you've already mentioned blockchain or crypto. We, of course, have everything else from personalized medicine to nanotechnology. Mm -hmm. um, and we have AI, machine learning, robotics. You know, I, I threw in quantum computing before. And we're at this point where we're seeing that there are potentially so many of these technologies and we're right at that right at that point where the semiconductor is not going away don't get me wrong but it's no longer revolutionary we incorporate it now into everything i mean even our light bulbs have semiconductors in them um, to regulate the kind of the output um so so in terms of paradigm shifts i don't think they actually come around that all often that's why they're so disruptive but if i kind of give you kind of the framework that i view the world through in terms of these trends because I think this really helps kind of set the scene of kind of why we live at this truly disruptive period. Because I think kind of what I'm most famous for saying is, is that we don't live just at another industrial revolution. I don't believe we're even in an industrial era anymore. 
but the, the scale of change, the magnitude of change that we're about to go through, in my opinion, is probably more analogous to when we stopped being hunter gatherers and we became a settled agrarian society. And we're talking about that scale of change, uh, complete production system change. Um, and the framework I often deliver is just to say you need to view the world through layers. And these layers, they basically have different speeds of updating and they have different magnitudes of change that they bring with them. At the very top layer, we're used to kind of products changing all the time. That's where often right. people say, oh, we've got this paradigm shift. It's not. It's just a new product. It's, mm. it's maybe an advancement, but it's not a fundamental shift. I mean, products can change annually, monthly, weekly. Digital products change daily. Um, below that layer, we have businesses. And businesses which harness the products, so the ones that are basically producing the products which are capturing our, our attention as consumers, they're the ones that thrive. And this is where when we see a business miss a trend change, a paradigm shift change, let's take Kodak, um, then they all of a sudden they disappear. You know, they that that layer changes. Below business, we then come down to infrastructure. And this is where I now throw technological disruption. Infrastructure is how businesses operate. It's it's the process, it's the philosophy, it's it's everything to do with how the system works. And when we get that shift change so let's go back to the semiconductor that was an infrastructure change same as with the steam engine or the locomotive or when we suddenly introduced electricity they were infrastructure changes and that's what we need to view these potential paradigm shifting innovations through is does it have the ability to change the infrastructure and if it does if it qualifies for that then it's potentially a paradigm shifting technology doesn't mean it's definitely there but it's got its potential to be there but it's when you go below that layer, it's when you go below that layer of infrastructure, you get into the slowest moving trends and megatrends. But when you see these shift, when you see trends and megatrends originate the movement from here, because normally we just see this lovely trickle down, that products change, businesses change, infrastructure changes, and it all just kind of goes around. Yeah, okay, there's some pretty turbulent times in there. <laughs> um, I'm not discounting that, but when you see the, the bottom three layers change, my word, it's a completely different ball game. So the bottom three layers are essentially uh, regulation, cultural philosophy, and the natural environment. And hmm. right now, I mean, what's making this so different to any paradigm shifting change or any disruptive change we've seen in the last, well, at least few hundred years, is that we have trends and megatrends on the move originating at every single layer. We have changes in the natural environment. We have changes in the cultural philosophy. We have changes going on, starting with regulation, not regulation responding to other changes but mm. we actually have governments around the world being proactive rather than reactive and of course we have that constant change in the upper layers right well i i love how you just spell that out and lay that out that makes a lot of sense to me this just reminds me that peter Thiel has been you know famously saying recently that we are in a great stagnation that nothing is really changing is that just because he is looking at the uh, the bottom layer, like you're like you're saying? Is he more looking at like the infrastructure and noting that the infrastructure isn't changing? He has never spelled it out like that. He's just saying like, you know, we're, sorry guys, like this technology isn't that impressive. We're really stagnating. Or, or how how do you make sense of that viewpoint? And do you agree with that viewpoint? Yeah, I, I don't know exactly how Pete's put that argument together. Um, but but for me, I mean, I'd say that this is. This is kind of normal for the stage of that innovation cycle that we're in, that when you get to the end of the, the, the kind of the technological disruption cycle. So, as I said, you know, the semiconductor, which has been the power behind the last 50 years from everything from computers to iPhones to, to, to everything else we've been talking about. When that first comes on the scene, when it finds its application, growth is tremendously fast. And then, of course, it, it flattens out. It it appears to stagnate. Right. What we miss, I think, you know, in, in every layer here is we like to kind of just extrapolate what's going on. We pretend because it's really nice and easy for our brains that the current rate of change is basically the rate of change we'll see forever now. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we blame Microsoft for this with that little black cross on an Excel spreadsheet because it just allows you to drag it indefinitely and you just go, oh, yeah, I plotted it all. I've modeled it all. But actually, right. when you when you look at innovations, when you look at these paradigm shifting changes, what you find is while change is always present, the pace of change is not. 
you get periods of really, really fast paced change, almost time jumps where we suddenly jump from one innovation or one production system to another. And there's periods of time where it seems like nothing is happening, that it seems like everything's benign and everything's just, oh, it's stagnating. Or from other people's view, the status quo is is like going to last forever. Um, but that's, again, as I said, it's an, it's an illusion. Um, everything in the world, including ourselves, is always in a state of impermanence. Uh, we're shifting from mm -hmm. one state to another. So how does AI play into this? And for that matter, do you have any thoughts on what the next infrastructural change is going to be? Yeah, I, I actually place AI probably closer to the the thing that's going to be the uh, the paradigm shifting change, just because what's really interesting, again, you know, something I haven't talked about in this kind of framework is when we get something called information revolutions. Um, mm -hmm. And again, this is based on looking back through history. When you get an information revolution, um, so that is essentially the, the parameters of that is sharing information or information becomes more easily available. There's a democratization of information and it's not held kind of in a secret vault or just by a few people. Is what you find is, is those drive the biggest revelations and upheavals in, in human society because they change cultural philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, so we could go back to but let's let's just go back to ancient Egypt, right? Writing on one walls, they could suddenly record things and that changed things. We could then come forward to the Gutenberg Press, where all of a sudden it was no longer just a select few people or the passing of knowledge from one generation to another. It was all of a sudden knowledge was now recordable and shareable beyond your village walls. We then get to, I mean, the 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 amazing one is the telephone. Every we you know, kind of in our generation, we now go, what the telephone's just <laughs> so simple and we don't even use it anymore um but back then i mean it was this it was this pe period of change and a radical transformation in how we communicated we could instantaneously speak to somebody uh you know intercontinentally transcontinentally whereas before that it would take weeks to get a message from one side of a country to another or one side of the world to another um and i think where I, ai brings this forward is it's just radically i mean if you i don't know how much you've used ai but um you know kind of certainly some like the chat gpt applications they yes they've still got a lot of things to iron out there's a, there's a certain amount of teething problems with data accuracy accuracy and things like that but what they're showing is there's a potential for information to be so readily at people's fingertips Mm -hmm. um and that i would say is 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 likely to drive if they can solve those teething issues um the next information revolution uh where we we as humans have to actually redefine what intelligence is um i mean it's that's pretty big right absolutely yeah i mean ai is fascinating it's it's fascinating and partly because it has been with us most blatantly through, I would say, movies and sci-fi novels for a very long time. And so I think that that's part of why whenever AI is mentioned, we always just like jump to the dystopian. Because, you know, how do you tell a good story unless like there's a big scary monster that's going to come get you and you have to like save the day to avoid the thing. Are you worried about dystopian futures with AI or do you think that a lot of that is just overblown? Uh, I, I think you always have to be a little bit concerned with dystopian futures, but not necessarily from the, the angle that people are scared of it. So if I unpack that, um, you're absolutely right. Hollywood does a great job of creating stories which basically trigger emotions in us, uh, which make us watch films and buy T-shirts and everything else. Um, and, you know, they basically end up somewhere with humanity is now kept as a pet um you know when we when we talk about robotics and ai okay. uh that they become our overlords um i think we need to view ai as a tool you know we've as as kind of a human race we have used tools ever since we discovered you know kind of sharp and pointy rocks and we start lashing them to sticks um and mm -hmm. this is another tool um so i think you have to i i do think you have to kind of acknowledge that it that it is a, a transformational force. And what I normally talk about here is kind of that dystopian future, that there's a, 
there's this kind of paradox that happens when you see change because we're shifting from one infrastructure to another because we're shifting from one way of life to another everything that is built on the current infrastructure suddenly has to move and so in the short term these this is why they're paradigm shifts and why so many other things that we talk about as paradigm shifts just aren't is that that's turbulent that's extraordinarily fractious the bigger the change the more fractious and the more turbulent in the short term but what happens in the long term is it progresses humanity i think that what we are about to go through is to is to correct our understanding of human intelligence we're actually not that good and maybe this is where we switch into psychology we're not actually that good at remembering stuff um mm -hmm. that's essentially what we class as intelligence though recall yet yeah, there's a reason why if there's a car crash the the police that arrive at the scene get a few people's witness statements because, mm -hmm. the, because everyone has a different view like recall is not actually our, our superpower as humans um but we like to promote that as what intelligence is now ai potentially if it can sort out its, its accuracy problems completely takes that away that recall is not what we do anymore um recall is is the purview of, of ai um and that shakes that shakes things up that shakes how you test intelligence that shakes what jobs are um that shakes shakes up everything but where it takes us is i believe that we we are kind of on the edge of um kind of i call it the age of awareness um that's where i think the zeitgeist of this next era is is we're starting to really tap in you know from neuroscience to psychology to brain science we're really starting to understand what we can do in terms of our potential um and we don't harness those things we don't pay any attention really to creativity i know there's lots of industries that do but we tend to think that that's just a super talent that a few select people will have and the rest of us should just chunk away at kind of laborious tasks um and i don't think that's true i think we've just basically covered over it and i think ai might be the thing which shifts us to go hold on a minute if this isn't what intelligence is to the human race what it is oh, it's over here so I do definitely want to jump into psychology next, but I, I hate to say it, but that just triggered a uh, a dystopian vision for myself, the way that you kind of phrased that there with, with AI is going to be our memory. I mean, to me, that sounds like a dystopian future because that's like surveillance state type of a thing. I mean, it's already interesting how this has infiltrated our lives in so many different ways. And it's like, fine, like I, I'm actually not too, you know, too down on this view, but I could see how some people would be it's so effective that we, we could do away with crime you know we could we could never have any crime you could paint scenarios where if you have the the uh you know the the mental predisposition to have like to be too aggressive or to be angered too quickly and we know this from the second you were born maybe you're just like followed around by a drone all the time i mean like zoltan isvan has talked about this to, for people who like don't put people in prison just have a drone follow them around that sort of thing like in in one view maybe that's like a utopia maybe that's great because we can literally do away with prisons and like stop crime from ever happening at the same time, like that could be a really terrifying thing for a lot of people. Do you, I mean, are you worried about like surveillance state and implication of AI serving the purpose of our memories? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, kind of the that picture you've just painted is not a utopian one for me. Um, uh, and I think this is where we, we have to be very careful with regulation. Um, you know, right. my view of regulation is that it's it's meant to serve a purpose of protecting me from you and you from me um mm -hmm. and much beyond that and it's it's kind of too overburdening um and so when we when we come to kind of this this thing on ai you know i i actually think yes you're right it might solve crime as we know it um but you know the, we're pretty good at inventing things as humans we'll just find a new way of crime and this is this is also where it becomes really interesting because if you want to just live in in the that middle lane then everything we've just talked about is probably right but what we do see so i mean this is where we now need to like talk about you know how do technologies change change the way we think um and when we come to kind of like the internet era and the search era 
what we find is people are far more um, middle of the road with their with their kind of views. They do less work to find it. Um, they're more accepting of things, and they will. So that you know, we can talk about anchoring bias and everything else. You know, if it's coming mm-hmm. from a, a supposedly reputable source, people will just jump on it. They'll take a sign bite, sign sound bite, and just run with it. And this is where you see these fractious arguments between, oh, so and so said this. Well, well, so and so said that. My my kind of concern with AI is um, essentially the language models that we see going on is it's just aggregating data. And whenever you aggregate data, you get an average. Um, And therefore, I actually see there's plenty of room for people to progress humanity and everything if you are prepared to look at the fringes. And that's going to be very different. That's going to be stepping out of the main AI models um, or perhaps looking at data differently to everybody else. Um, but, uh, But yeah, I think, you know, as with everything, that's where innovation comes from. It comes from the weak signals. It comes from the fringes. It always has through history. Um, and it, I believe it always will afterwards. We are the most creative, adaptable and innovative creatures going. Um, and we're always curious of what lies just beyond that kind of the, the obvious. So I'm going to pivot here. Tell me about performance psychology, what is that exactly? And how do you use it as a professional in that field? Yeah, so perform, performance psychology is basically just um, the way it was described to me first when I was a, a very, very young athlete, um, actually out in your beautiful country up in the Green Mountains in Vermont, um, was I was introduced to this concept by a sports psychologist at the time just who said, and it was profound to me at age 14, this um, <laughs> There's a there's a physical game and there's a mental game. Um, in the sporting world, you know we're we're very hot on both of those sides. We know that the very best athletes in the world, if you're just technically good but your head's not in it, you don't you don't perform to the best. You don't become one of the world's best. In the business arena, it's extraordinarily different. There's very very few people in the business arena who really focus on the mental game. They kind of mm. assume as long as they're not burnt out or stressed out of their mind, well, everything's cool. Um, but that's just not the case. When you actually dig into kind of what happens in the kind of the, the moderate realms of stress. Um, so this would kind of if we take this kind of to a sporting analogy, you know, you're losing your head or um, you're out the zone. Um, you know, physically, you actually change. Physically, you become tight. You're, you're mm-hmm. breathing a respiration rate tick up your heart rate ticks up uh, essentially what we're talking about in these states is you're you're being triggered by something in the environment which is saying it's dangerous or there's a threat to you now in the business environment where performance psychology comes in is it's about allowing people to navigate and thrive in these truly disruptive eras um, the first thing to go when we start to become chronically stressed is our ability to have abstract thinking. So if I'm talking to an audience, I'll often mm. ask them a question. Um, I just say, I'll oh, raise your hand when I say the place you have your best thinking. And I always start with the office because nobody puts their hand up, it's quite funny. Um, you know, there's place we've built for work and nobody has the best thinking there. And as soon as you start saying, oh, shower, people's hands fly up or the, or the beach or out for a walk or yoga or mm-hmm. walking the dog or gardening, whatever that, whatever it might be for them. Now, what they're uncovering or what they're showing is that the, their thinking is connected to a state. It's not actually anything to do with that location. It's not something magical about a shower that gives you abstract and creative thoughts. It's just about what state your brain and, and physiology is in. So mm. where, where performance psychology and behavioral science are basically now giving us real insight is it's about controlling our physiology and states so that we can access different thought patterns and behaviors um the biggest the biggest kind of uh, thing uh, as you alluded to right at the start of this conversation is when the world becomes disruptive it becomes uncertain and uncertainty is hardwired into our system to trigger the stress response because you and me this organism our brain's primary job is to keep it alive that's that's a, you know, we, we forget this in a modern world. We think our brains to do this and this, but really its primary job is just to get, I want to keep this organism going. Um, 
and when we kind of come back to its evolutionary wiring, what we find is is uncertainty. If we go back 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 years, when this was kind of highly developed or specified to that era, is if if there was a something of uncertainty as we stepped out the cave, then you would suddenly stop being joyous and creative and joking around and playing, and you become hyper aware, hyper vigilant. Your energy levels will tick up because it's better to be pessimistic and fearful than just laid back and be like, oh, I, th- I think I smell a lion. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just going to carry on kicking this stone round. Um, so th- the issue is that our modern world triggers us so much, but it's still mm-hmm. responding as if there's a lion outside the cave. That's probably the easiest way to put it. Now, our bodies and brains are even more incredible than that. It's not just this kind of sophistication of, of sensory inputs. If you constantly are in that state of being triggered, i.e. your stress response is creeping up, I'm not saying stressed out, but just always in that state of mobilization. You'll hear people say, I, I can't switch off. I can't stop thinking. Uh, I'm, I'm efficient. I'm driven. All these kind of things. And you'll know these people that they can't switch off. Mm-hmm. What's actually going on under the surface is their, is their brain is rewiring so that they are constantly in that state because the body goes, oh, do you know what? You spend so much time here. It's more efficient for me just to wire you so that this is your set point. This is your default. Right. And then yeah. this is where we now start linking it to if you just stay there for, for too long. Well, this is where we start linking in all the stress related illnesses. Um, we could link in uh, addictive habits as ways to try and de-stress and reaching for external things. Mm hmm. But in the short term, the bit that we've overlooked, I think, is the effect it has on our decision making. And if we are to overcome the hurdles and obstacles, which we really do have ahead, whether that's disruptive technology or it's a changing natural environment, um, then if we are in this higher state of stress, when we start looking at behaviors and relationships, we start seeing that we're more disengaged than empathetic. We're less cooperative. We're less creative. Actually, all of the things which are coming at us require us to be at a lower stress state. But this is the complete reverse of our wiring. Yeah, well, I'm I'm really interested in what you said about the office because I feel that hard. Right now, I work from home, so this isn't something I deal with that much. I go into an office maybe once a month. But, I mean, I remember when I, several years ago, I was working at Indiegogo and I was their content marketing manager. I wasn't there for too long. But uh, it was the first place I ever worked where they had that open office plan. And I was working with content, right? So I was like drafting, you know, articles and pulling up images. And it all felt very personal because writing is so personal. And it was the sort of thing where like, I don't know, you know, armies of people could walk by and see exactly what I was doing. And I always felt so just like so stressed about it. And and thankfully I was allowed to like take a laptop into like their library room and sit down and and draft articles like hidden in a corner. Right. And I just, every time I would just write so much better hidden in a corner with on my laptop rather than like in this open office setting. And I've read articles about how that's true, that people feel like, you know, their people can jump out you know, from behind you. And like, it's, it's, you know, it's got some evolutionary thing about a peripheral vision. Like what would be the the solution there? Would the solution there be to just do away with the open office or is there a performance psychology way to kind of just like, you know, tweak your thinking or tweak your is the acceptance of the, of the environment that you're stuck in. I don't know. Like how would a, how would a performance psychologist step into that situation and help someone like me who is just feeling like not only like anxious, but threatened in this situation within my open office. I, I, I feel your pain. Yeah. Like I'm, the, I'm exactly the same. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, I mean the, the kind of the, the, the tactics with a, with an open office, are, are just a decrease sensory input as much as you can. Um, and you know, that's kind of where, uh, you know, as, as you achieved, you found quieter spaces you, and, you know, if that's not available, then noise canceling headphones are amazing. Um, because what we actually find is, is that it's, it's not just cues of danger. So it's not about necessarily a stress response as such. It's just distraction. Hmm. Um, you know, there's been some really good research on this in terms of, I, I'm going to quote this, but it's, 
but I, I might have the timing wrong. I'm sure the, your listeners will jump on me if I have. Um, but it's, it's something like it takes 23 minutes to refocus, completely refocus uh, after a distraction point. Um, hmm. And, you know, kind of when you kind of consider how long you can go in an open plan office without any distraction, you don't get much work done in that really kind of in, in the zone or the flow state. Because that's what it's about, um, you know, that that we have been running um, offices to kind of time management for so long, which, again, is, is really an industrial revolution, re- revolutionary idea that, you know, nine to five came about because to pull a, a, a lever in a, a factory, well, let's do it in daylight. So let's do nine to five. Um, mm-hmm. There is no science behind, oh, this is definitely when humans have their best thinking or they produce their best work. In fact, you know, as individuals, you know, my best work is done, you know, I'm crazy early. I I, I can do my deep work between like 6 a.m. and about midday. And I after that, the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and the kind of a broad brush approach of just like, no, the hours are nine to five doesn't actually get the best out of you and me. But worse for you and me is it actually it pressures us to try and force work out in periods of time where it's just not natural mm-hmm. so when i'm at home i can do far more work than i'm in the office um but yeah absolutely it's it's about limiting the distractions and you know kind of pulling back as much as you can i think in, in the future you know companies are going to uh, realize this i think this is where we potentially are at a lovely period of time where some people really do enjoy the office space and they actually do get more work done there than they at home because they've got distractions at home. Um, and, you know, we're, we're kind of playing around with things. Some companies are telling everybody to come back in the office. Some pe- companies are saying, no, stay at home. Some are operating hybrid models. And this is really the experimentation phase. And this is what we humans do. We experiment. We kind of go, OK, well, let's try this. See if this works for us. See if this works for our staff. The company that lands on the solution Whatever that might look like, whether it's personalized hours, personalized workspaces, some people in open plan, some people in closed offices, who knows what it, the final solution will look like, but they will suddenly have this advantage that their staff are not only not burnt out and not stressed, but they're producing far more productive work. And then everybody else, there's a race for them to go, we need a bit of that. Are you a fan of the four day work week or any of those other experiments that are being tried? Uh, I'm in a, I'm a fan of just anything which optimizes energy over time. Um, you know, I, I don't think just changing the, the number of days does that because so many people then go, okay, well I'll do 12 hour days for four days and then I get three days off. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure they do any better work. Um, you hear a lot of people say, oh, I do exactly the same amount of work, but I just get paid for four days now. <laughs> um, right, right. Um, so for me, it's it's about you know kind of a lot of my work on the on the kind of the working with entrepreneurs and CEOs and and kind of I call them ambitious individuals. Anybody who's like ambitious, um, one of the first things I I do is I, I kind of teach them. I have a framework which I develop called the pause, pause, move framework. And the idea behind these two pauses is when we come across something which is a highly a high stakes decision or a high stress decision or a highly disruptive environment that we're trying to make decisions in, the first thing we actually need to do is is to to pause and assess what state we're in. Go back to that question of where you have your best thinking. If we can access those lower stress states, which we can, it's just a it's just a case of of learning it and training ourselves to do this. Um, then all of a sudden we start managing ourselves in a completely different way. Um, and we start accessing our brains. Our brains become so much more efficient when we're, when we're in a state of joy. Joy is a scientific state, not just mm. a, a made-up term. <laughs> it's, an in, it's basically the inner state of happiness. Happiness is normally external. Joy is, is an internal state. Um, but when we're in those states, that's where we get our best insights, our breakthroughs, our aha moments the abstract thinking it's where we can connect with other people it's where we can be intimate and empathetic um but it's also where our system and our physiology works the best once you've trained somebody to be able to bring themselves down to that level and access those thoughts the next step is then to train them to go up very very slightly and this is where we start now training people to be in flow states in the zone Mm. where it's a slightly more energized state than just purely calm 
uh, if you kind of think the calm state is like your Zen Buddhist monk, um, it's not particularly energized though. And so when right. we're talking about work, we just edge it up very slightly. And it's that training of edging it up, but not going too far and being able to regulate back down. Um, so that that for me is kind of, you know, one of the key things is is inner mastery is, is mm. going to be absolutely key in the next coming, well, few decades. Is it true that making a decision takes quite a bit of energy and we only have so much, you know, power per day to make you know, decisions. You hear these stories about like how Steve Jobs would wear the same thing every day. So we didn't have to like wake up with a decision to make. He would save all that energy up for like later in the day when we have to make important decisions. I think Zuckerberg does effectively the same thing. Is there truth to that? There, there's certainly theories to it. Um, I mean, this this is always the case within neuroscience and brain science, isn't it? That, that there are, mm -hmm. We have theories of these things. And it's certainly one I, I, I think there is some truth in it. I certainly feel this in myself. Um, so one of them would be co cognitive load theory mm. um, and cognitive load theory is just saying that we, we only have so much capacity in, within a, any space or any period of time. Um, so it's not so much that thinking itself is, you know, a, a thought is, is energy intensive, but if you just constantly just running the cogs, emotions can be, can be energy zapping. Um, that's probably more aligned with it. Um, but yeah, cognitive load theory would say that we can get ourselves just into this state of like ego depletion or, or cognitive fatigue. Um, and certainly if you've, you know, you're not taking care of yourself from a well-being stance, you know, that's enhanced even more. If you're staying up late and drinking alcohol and, and then trying to get up early in the morning and work, it do, you, you know in yourself that it just, it just doesn't happen. You have less reserves to to basically focus on the task. Right. Well, coming back to your book... In your uh, in the subtitle, you say we should be optimistic about the future. So let me ask, why should we be optimistic, and what makes you optimistic about the future? I th I think the, the the reason for me being optimistic is is actually when well twofold. I, I'm going to firstly go back through history. Is if we can achieve some of the things that we've been talking about, this kind of self mastery, um, then and this is the era for us to do it with all the science that's helping us. If we can do that, then we basically harness what I think is humanity's greatest attribute. And it's this attribute of what I call playfulness. And playfulness is um, it's curiosity, it's innovation, it's creativity, it's cooperation with others. You know, that's what playfulness is. And we, we take ourselves too seriously as adults. You know, we kind of go, well, playfulness is just what kids do. Once you become an adult, it's all just about seriousness and stress. Um, and it's it's completely not how we're meant to function. Um, so I, I think there's I think there's a lot to be done there. There's there's a lot to unlock that we haven't yet done. And and you know, when we're talking about human potential and unlocking these things, that takes us to a whole new realm of where we could go. So that's one of the things. The other the other thing is when you look back through history. It's that, that human ability to be playful, to be creative, to be innovative, to be adaptable, that we have walked out of situations time and time again, which is not luck. We've innovated and adapted our way out of it. Um, that's very different to saying that we find a way to keep the current world exactly as it is. And I don't think that should be a goal. Like we've got to move with things, not try and stop things. Um, but optimism comes from those two areas. And I think as soon as you start looking around you, um, when you start looking at the rate of innovation, the rate of kind of products and solutions coming through, you can't help but be like, oh, my word, this is things are moving so fast. And, you know, kind of mass media and things just doesn't tell the story of it because unfortunately talking about solutions doesn't sell papers it doesn't generate clicks on websites it's far better to have a negative news headline that we're all doomed um hollywood sells movies off if we as we've talked about it's far more boring just to kind of like tell the truth and, and say oh we've got we've got these hurdles but we've also got all these amazing solutions we're running out of time which is unfortunate because there is so much to talk about right here let me just ask one semi-hard question which is that right now we're having 
I mean, especially in America, probably the UK as well, but we're having a, a huge mental health crisis, particularly with young people. And, you know, Jonathan Haidt and others have tied it to social media as, as a, you know, primary cause for this. I think that it also, you know, might just go into other issues like economic issues, I think is probably a factor. I'm skeptical about it, but people also say that, you know, the, the downfall of religion might have something to do with it where people have a harder time finding purpose in life, perhaps. There, there are all of these different theories about why there is so much anxiety and so much depression with the youth. And, you know, with, with a lot of people, I think the millennials felt this pretty hard as well, even though we're no longer like that young necessarily. What, what do you think about that? And what, what do you think is the societal fix, if there is one, to trying to steer us in the correct direction? Is it something as simple as like everyone just like get off your damn phones and like close your social media accounts? Is it something like that? Or, or can we keep these arguably very harmful tools in our pockets, in our lives, and still somehow, you know, mentally thrive? Uh, so, I mean, for me, there's a there's a single word answer here, um, and that's stress. You know, it's essentially what we've just talked about. Uh, when you see a lot of these things, whether it's reality TV, whether it's social media, whether it's drinking, drugs, shopping addictions, what we're trying to do is we're trying to change our state. We're trying to find these dopamine hits mm -hmm. um, because we are you know kind of coming back to to what we were talking about being triggered by the environment we are sense the world is moving faster it's more complex and the pace of change and uncertainty is triggering us and we are i fundamentally believe uh seeing you know kind of these incredible um scenes and things devastating scenes of of young people with anxiety burnout depression uh, we could link a lot more ill health to stress than just that and what we've been doing is we've been treating all these things as individual symptoms um, mm. and trying to tackle, oh, well, social media does this or uh, obesity is caused by McDonald's or whoever, you know, kind of process, highly processed food producers. Um, and it's it's just not the case, you know, kind of what's really what we should be doing is going, OK, well, what's the root cause? And the root cause is stress. And when we become stressed, we become we become short focused. We seek immediate gratification. You know, kind of if you can recall a stress period in your life, you'll know that feeling if you don't even know what you want. You just want some mm. pleasure. Um, and so what we what we're kind of on the cusp of is if we can solve the stress issue and that becomes self mastery and self regulation. Um, then all of a sudden we start to see so many of these different things which are becoming massive problems in society naturally fall away because the person who who isn't in that heightened stress state doesn't go and just impulse shop. That person who isn't in a stress state doesn't beat themselves up because they went to the fridge and just ate and ate and ate even though they know they should be on a diet. What, what that stress state does, and I'm not talking about stressed out, by the way, you know, we tend to think of stress as binary, either we're calm or stressed. There's many levels in between. And it's those many levels that we're talking about. In society, we don't talk about it as stress, but we should. Um, and it's in with those zones where we start maladaptive behaviors, we start doing things which are against our, our, our even our own better judgment. There'd be countless people that you'll speak to that kind of go, oh, I know that kind of binge watching TV is not good for me, but I stayed up until 2 a.m. doing it anyway. And then mm -hmm. I felt crap the next day. Um, and we know that these things are, but what happens is, is when we're not controlling our state, we're far less in control of ourselves than we like to be. We fall into these kind of maladaptive habits and behaviors. So for me, we've got to address the root cause. And the root cause is teaching people to actually be, be self-masters of their states and emotions. Do you have some resources that you'd recommend to folks? Maybe some some books, YouTube channels, anything like that? Um, help, help this, that? Is, this is a shameless plug, but if people can wait like six months, I've got a second book coming out. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Um, which is uh, the working title at the moment is Pause, Pause, Move. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's 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 loads of stuff out there. Some of the organizations which are doing great work in this. Um, there's a there's a couple of American institutions. One's called Polyvagal Theory. 
um, mm. polyvagal institution, which is looking at kind of how our autonomic nervous system brings in social cues or kind of environmental cues um, and how we can learn to regulate that. Um, mm. And the other is is then something called emotional brain training, uh, EBT, um, which again is is run by a few very impressive kind of American uh, psychologists, neuro, neuro, uh, neuroscientists and brain scientists, um, really looking at how emotions and leaning into emotions is key, not something to suppress or repress, which we were often taught to do. Um, so, yeah, there's there's tons of resources. But as I said, actually, that's um, yeah, you've 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 beautifully linked to my my current work, uh, <laughs> which is which is looking at all this kind of the state state management of ourselves. Um, because I think it's going to be one of the most required uh, skills, uh, one of the most sought after skills in the next few decades. Excellent. That's a great pitch. Well, Marshall, thank you so much for coming on to Futurism. The book is Decoding Change. And real quick, where can folks find out more about what you are up to? Uh, probably the best place. If I just direct them to my website, so it's theuncertaintyscientist.com. Um, Excellent. Then everything is kind of on there, links to everything. So great. Thanks so much. Hey, well, thanks again. That was fascinating and a lot of fun.